In this video, I'm going to show you how I made these panels that I installed in my basement. They're actually covers on base traps. And like it says in the title, I didn't use a CNC machine for this. Although in the time it took to drill all these holes, I'm pretty sure that I could have had a good start on building one. So that's something to consider if you want to do this, you're in for a lot of work. First off, it didn't occur to me before I started that I should be recording this. So I didn't show the very first part, which was cutting out the panels to the correct size. And that's roughly 24 inches wide and 48 inches long. So each one of these panels is about one quarter of a full sheet of plywood. And to mark out where the holes go, uh, the first thing I did was figure out how far they have to be from the edge on all sides. And then I drew a grid, and this was my first mistake, actually. I wasn't careful enough drawing this grid. I didn't think it would make that much of a difference, and in the end, really, it doesn't. But I would recommend laying out the grid as carefully as you possibly can, and that way you'll wind up with the best hole spacing. Now, about the hole spacing, this type of panel has a name, at least the one that's proper does. It's called the Binary Amplitude Diffuser Panel. And like I said, there are sequences that you can follow, but I didn't do that. Mainly what I was looking for here was to increase the reflective surface of the front of the base traps that I built. And there are several ways you can do that. And one of them is to build a panel that's perforated. Another way is to cover it with slats that have openings between so that some of the sound can go through to the inside of the base trap. So basically all I was looking for was a percentage of the front of the panel that's actually open and then the rest of it being closed so that it reflects sound back. Now, of course, I'll get comments saying that this panel is useless because it doesn't follow that binary amplitude sequence. And of course, it probably would be more effective if I had to uh, follow those sequences, but I don't think it would be that much more effective. I mean, it's not like the sound is gonna, you know, come to the hole and see that it's not the right sequence and then turn around and go back, <laughs> okay? It's just gonna go through. The sound isn't intelligent. It does what it does. It goes through holes. Anyway, so you're watching me drill these holes and if I had to do it over again, I would do it a different way. And I wanna talk about that briefly right now. And to illustrate that, I drew something up in SketchUp Imagine that this is your panel, and then you're going to determine how far the holes need to be from the edge. After you determine how big the holes need to be, and the, this particular sequence that you're going to use, and whatever, you need to lay out a grid. Like I said, you want to do that as precisely as you possibly can, so that the hole spacing looks even, because some people, that just drives them crazy if the holes are slightly <laughs> off. Then after you have that grid laid out, you mark where the holes are going to be. And I think the easiest way to do that, and the one that I use, is just draw a circle around the cross point in the grid where you want a hole. And then the next step that I recommend is to drill a pilot hole with a 1 8 inch bit all the way through this panel. And then use this panel, after you've drilled all of those 1 8 inch holes, as a template for laying out the other panels. That does two important things for you. First, it will make drilling the holes a lot easier. When you're drilling with a Forstner bit, it works a lot better if there's a pilot hole there. Believe me, you'll cut your drill time in half or more. And the second thing it does is that it ensures that the spacing is correct on the next panel that you're gonna drill. What happens when you're using a Forstner bit is that it can drift as it drills through the material. That means it can go side to side slightly. And I had a lot of that happening when I was drilling mine. The 1 8 inch pilot hole will guide the Forstner bit straighter through the material. And then any drift that happens won't be transferred to the next panel. With the pilot holes drilled through, it might seem like a good idea to drill part of the way from the back, but I don't recommend doing this. What I recommend instead is taking the panel and screwing it down to a backer so it's nice and tight and flat down to that so that it minimizes the amount of blowout you have on the back. If you get a little bit of blowout on the back, it really doesn't matter because it's the back of the panel and you really can't see it. And of course, there will be people argue with me on this too, but it really won't affect the sound. Now, as for screwing it down to the backer, I recommend using washers with your screws. 
the washer should be bigger than the hole that you're going to be drilling. That way you can transfer it to a hole that you just drilled so you can drill out the hole where the screw used to be. In all cases, you want to put these screws through this, the hole location, like through that 1 8 inch uh, pilot hole that you drilled. And as for what to use for backer, I would recommend using something like MDF. Here in the video, you can see I'm using OSB, but the glue that they use in OSB seems to be harder, or at least maybe they use more of it than in MDF, and it tends to dull the bit very quickly. So as you drill through the panel and into the OSB, you're wearing out your bit quicker, whereas MDF is very easy to drill into. So after several days of drilling, I was finally done. I could mount the panels where they go. And I'm doing this in my basement. Um, the floor is not level, the walls are not plumb, like there's nothing square. So I gotta make these things fit. And that includes scribing it to the floor because I don't wanna add any baseboard to this to cover any gap. And then on one side of the room, it's taller than the other side of the room. So I made, both of these upper panels, which are slightly shorter, uh, the same height, the height that matches the longer one, and now I have to cut uh, the shorter one to fit. However, you, you just can't just trim that amount off the top, it's like an inch. So what I'm doing is I'm averaging it between the panel that I'm putting on, the shorter one, and I'm also trimming some off the, the panel that I already put on, on the bottom, to better match the one above. This is a trick that you know carpenters use all the time to deal with this kind of stuff so that even though everything is not straight and true, it looks that way. And the traditional carpentry or woodworking term for this is cheating, where you average out any error that's happening so that it's not noticeable. With all of the panels fitting properly, I can move on to beveling the edge. That's part of the look that I'm going for here. And then I'm gonna sand the face to remove any um, discoloration and make it smoother. And then of course I need to apply a finish. And in this case, I'm using water-based polyurethane. I actually took the panels outdoors and I sprayed them, even though it's winter. I quickly sprayed it and brought it back in the house to dry. And I managed to get three coats on each one. I let the polyurethane dry overnight and now I can get the cloth put on the back. What the cloth does is it keeps the fiberglass inside and it also blacks out the holes so they actually look better. And to fasten that, I'm using polyurethane construction adhesive and I'm also using staples to hold that in place until the glue dries. You don't have to worry about pulling this super tight to get rid of wrinkles because you won't be able to see those wrinkles after the panels are installed. Anyway, here they are again, and this is just one part of the acoustic treatment that I'm doing to the room. There'll be other parts that will follow, so stay tuned for those.